Hi, welcome to Crash Course U.S. History. I'm John Green. Just kidding, I'm Brown. And today we're going to talk about the longest, bloodiest, and perhaps most morally reprehensible war the United States ever conducted against Native Americans. I'm talking about the Seminole War, or should I say wars, as there is technically three of them. Viewers of our previous videos should know by now that 19th century America had a rather low opinion of their indigenous counterparts, to the point that many of the leaders of the nominally free and democratic United States gained notoriety by subjugating, repressing, and otherwise slaughtering Native Americans. The Seminole Wars were slightly different if only because Andrew Jackson managed to start a war this time rather than belatedly ending one. So before we go into the war itself, we have to look at what was going on in the southeast at the time. By the mid-18th century, Florida came to be dominated by a homogenous group of Hitchiti-speaking people that came to be known as the Seminoles. Though closely related to the neighboring creek, the Seminoles developed an identity of their own and established a strong trade network between various colonial powers in control of Florida, notably the British and Spanish. The tribe was further bolstered by the addition of large numbers of escaped slaves, who, once entering Florida, found themselves readily adopted by the Seminole tribes. These so-called Black Seminoles would be instrumental in both the cultural and political developments of the Seminole people in the 19th century, and rustled more than a few feathers farther north. The now crumbling Spanish Empire was powerless to control the Seminoles and their allies, having about as much influence over the region as a swamp mosquito. These tensions came to a head when the U.S. decided to invade Florida to eliminate the Seminole threat in 1818 choosing none other than the future Mad King of America, Andrew Targaryen, I mean Jackson. Jackson, already established Indian fighter, was ordered by President Monroe to lead 3,500 men into Spanish West Florida, killing and capturing Native Americans whilst also taking numerous settlements and forts along the way. This, of course, did not please Spain, although it did make them aware of how little control they had over Florida. So instead of allowing the U.S. to simply take Florida by force, Spain signed the adams onis Treaty in 1819, in which Spain ceded Florida to the U.S. in exchange for settling border disputes in the West. Hint for future videos, said disputes were never actually settled. I'm looking at you, Mexican-American War. This, of course, raised numerous questions relating to the Seminoles, as they now lived in territory governed by the U.S., which was significantly more strict than the Spanish. Once Florida was officially transferred to the U.S., the Seminoles were forced to live on a reservation in central Florida and were under some pretty severe pressure by the government to hand over any escaped slaves they were harboring. The Seminoles, of course, refused, and life went on with dispersed violence in here and there because raiding is fun, I guess. This all changed in 1830, however, when Andrew Jackson, now president and as hateful towards Indians as ever, signed the Indian Removal Act, which called for Native Americans living east of the Mississippi River to move west to what is now Oklahoma. This would later precipitate the event known as the Trail of Tears, which would result in the death of thousands of Native Americans as they trekked across the South with little in the way of supplies or nourishment. The Seminoles themselves signed the Treaty of Payne's Landing in 1832, where they supposedly gave up their claims in Florida and agreed to relocate west. This treaty, as with all treaties with distorted Native American bands, had the problem that it wasn't ratified by the Seminole Nation as a whole, and it was quickly rebuked by the majority of Seminole leaders to the point that the Seminole War Chief Osceola allegedly plunged a knife into the document during negotiations. By 1835, Jackson sent troops to enforce the treaty, and the Seminoles were more than ready to meet them. The first few battles of the war saw entire American detachments being wiped out by significantly smaller Seminole war parties during expeditions into the reservation. The Seminoles were led by the now-famous Osceola, and numbered at about 3,000 men, as compared to the American forces, which numbered at around 30,000. This numerical disadvantage did not hinder the Seminoles in their cause as much as the U.S. government had wanted to believe, and instead the war raged on for a good seven years thanks to the impenetrable Florida swamps and some less than competent U.S. commanders. The U.S. Army was further hindered by the fact that they couldn't campaign during summer months due to things like disease and the oppressive Florida heat. The war seemingly came to an end in 1837 with the Battle of Okachibi, which resulted in a large number of deaths on both sides, but the Seminoles kept fighting, retreating further and further into the Everglades. At this point, the U.S. was desperate to end the war, going as far as capturing Seminole war leaders, including Osceola, under the false pretense of negotiating a peace. This did little to break the fighting spirits of the Seminoles, however, but their numbers continued to dwindle as more and more were either captured, killed, or turned themselves in. By 1839, the American government officially attempted to sue for peace with the Seminoles, the first time a Native American group had ever forced such an action to be taken by the U.S. Negotiations broke down rather quickly due to the distrust towards Americans, which isn't really surprising considering, I don't know, all of U.S. history. The war continued for yet another three years with no decisive victory by either side. The U.S. officially declared the war at an end in 1842 after over seven years of fruitless campaigning. 
By this point, however, many Seminole bands had already turned themselves in, and by war's end, over 4,000 Seminoles had been relocated to Oklahoma. Despite this, several hundred Seminoles remained in Florida and still remain there to this day, a testament to how both stubborn and how dedicated they were to their way of life. The Americans didn't fare any better, and in many ways fared far worse than their Native American counterparts. By the end of their seven-year campaign, over 1,500 soldiers lay dead due to a mixture of disease and actual fighting, and the end cost of the U.S. government totaled to about $30 million, which was quite the sum considering that the total federal budget for the U.S. in 1836 was only $25 million. Though there was a third conflict that broke out in 1855, it was relatively inconsequential, and most remember the Second Seminole War as the most influential because, as we all know, second is the best. Looking back, the war was easily one of the longest and bloodiest conflicts between whites and Native Americans, one that showed how unwilling many Indian groups were to moving west in the face of increased pressure by both white settlers and government. The fact that despite over two decades of nearly continuous fighting, the Seminoles still managed to exist in number in Florida is a testament to both the human spirit and how attached a group can be to their land. It's important we remember these things, if only to remind ourselves that war isn't as passionless as recent events have made it seem. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash Course was written by me, directed by me, produced by me, filmed by, filmed by me, and I, I, I did everything, yeah, I did everything.